Well, it seems that we have most of the people back from the coffee break. I, I hope you did enjoy the coffee and snacks. I know I did. And uh, I think it's time for us to continue with our program. And uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Divina from Eggs. This CV has a lot of French words. I'm, I'm afraid I won't be able to correctly pronounce all of them. But she is professor of media so sociology at the Sorbonne University, France. And she holds several degrees from Sorbonne University, Stanford University, and Annenberg School of Communications at University of Pennsylvania. She's a specialist in media and information technologies from a comparative perspective, as well as a researcher in media uses and practices of young people. At Sorbonne Nobel University, she's a creator and director of master's program, Aigeme, Aigeme. Well, it's abbreviation, with two specialties, uh, one in e-learning engineering and the other in media education engineering, with online courses for students in French-speaking countries as well as other regions of the world. As of uh, 2013, she holds the UNESCO chair for um, I think you will be probably able to explain it yourself. It has a lot of French words. <laughs> uh, and she is leading member of the EU consortium ECO that aims at providing MOOCs, which is online courses for pedagogical uses of the web. She's also director of CLMI with the French Ministry of Education and has published extensively in the areas of media content, information and journalism, technologies and subcultures of the screen and the relationship between media and technologies. Dear Frau Maix, the stage is yours. Hello, thank you for this um, extensive introduction of things I had forgotten I, I do. Um, because in fact I'm going to talk to you from the perspective of um, another project I, I pilot, which is uh, Translate. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and I thank you for um, inviting me. I've often contributed to IFLA and uh, this is the first time I'm talking to Eblida, but very pleased to, to do that. and. Um, Thank you, uh, Vincent Bonnet, in particular, for thinking of uh, inviting me. Uh, we are both uh, trying to um, elaborate um, a roadmap for culture in Europe, in the Council of Europe, and uh, a recommendation on uh, the um, um, Internet of Citizens mm -hmm. to contrast with the Internet of um, Things. <clears throat> and what I'm going to present, I hope, is going to contribute to that. Um, Linking back to um, Sven and what he said, and the difficulty for us, uh, our generation, to think of, um, the from the perspective of young people, I'm going to try and, to, and do that, particularly, uh, so that we, um, we um, try to consider the future uh, on an evidence-based perspective, not just our impressions. Um, Vincent, when I asked him what do you want me to talk about, gave me a sort of wish list, which is here. Young people, libraries and literacies, public policies, means to continue a public mandate. So I'm going to try and answer that in 30 minutes. My big question is the last one at the bottom. Is the pre-digital library form capable to deliver? So it's a question I'm asking us. I don't have the answer. Uh, and of course, the answer is in the cloud. Um, so Translate to, to Go very quickly is a research project financed by the French uh, National Research Agency. And we have several tasks in that uh, project. Uh, I'm going to uh, give you preliminary results of task two, the task on devices and users. Uh, and this task um, looked at young people and examined their digital competences in relation to information cultures. So we looked at the um, situations, their strategies, their uses, and uh, the perimeter of transliteracy. This is the universe. It's not unlike ours. And uh, what you notice is that it's, um, it's, it's sedimented. 
it's piled up, it's very complex, uh, chaotic in many ways, and uh, paper still has some importance. But um, I'd like us to think not so much in terms of paper or books, as uh, in terms of information, because that's, that's a big mutation even for libraries. So when you look at their tastes in reading, um, and I've only selected the reading dimension of our research, not the writing, which is a bit difficult because as, you, as I'll show you, they both uh, interact much more than in the past. <clears throat> um, young people read a lot. That's the good news. Uh, they are very ambitious. They read extremely long sagas, fantasy, books that can be up to 700 pages per volume, and then you have seven volumes over seven years. So it's a very extensive time. Uh, manga series, I call this uh, serial experiencing. They experience life serially, uh, and they're accompanied by media throughout their lives uh, in ways uh, that are unprecedented and that are not um, discontinuous or discrete, but continuous. Uh, their tastes are extremely eclectic. They'll go from old books, second-hand books, to um, latest uh, book uh, um, stories supported by games. They are mostly uh, connecting their reading to writing. They make comments, they annotate, they mix, they curate. And so um, their reading is not the classical way. It's not patrimonial, it's not respectuous, and it's not paper only. This is what we have to put aside as people who were trained in the classic way. There is a continuum of practices for them, online and offline. It's not segmented as we may perceive it. So for instance, this is a view account of a young girl on Babelio that you may know, it's a French social network, sort of library social network. Uh, and she is commenting her books uh, with 305 friends. Oops, sorry. And here you have an extract of a blog on Skyblog with two young boys discussing novels. They read a lot of series online. They buy it online, they buy it anywhere, secondhand bookstores, whatever. And one of them writes fan fictions. Again, reading and writing, extremely connected. <clears throat> Who do they mediate with professionally? Not librarians, publishers. And also pure players, content aggregators and curators, amateur peer networks. I hope this is nothing new for you. I'm just trying to put all of this in the conversation. Um, so there's a direct appeal from the publishers to young people, bypassing librarians and traditional uh, book, uh, bookkeepers, with a lot of enriched contents quizzes, games, etc., associated to their universe of predilection. Um, and so traditional mediators, of course, like librarians and cultural animators are displaced. They've lost their monopoly. This is something we are all mourning, but maybe um, if we take it from their perspective, we, we should take it in a different view also and not mourn, just um, embrace the change and see how we can um, accompany it. Physical spaces where they read, the public libraries, they're there. Uh, school learning centers, media centers, but also, of course, online resources and stores. The places where they are, they are now very complex places. They're social, technical, cultural, like the one around here. Um, and what we find is that they end up defining their own space within this larger space. And here you can see that there's two, at least two or three groups, and they have managed to create their own private little world. Uh, that's how they function. They function in groups, they don't function alone. Reading is no longer something you do alone. Um, so they play around uh, institutional spaces that are not constructed for them and not constructed for the digital, and they try to reintroduce uh, their own um, strategies and uh, make it into a familiar environment. Oops, what's happening here? So if we look at um, 
how the digital has augmented reading spaces, and this is what we can all uh, sort of agree with. Um, the reading devices have now reached extremely good ergonomics, and so paper is down, uh, and this is recent. Uh, there is a lot of mobility introduced by, in reading devices, and um, there is also a much better use now of all the functionalities afforded by the internet for reading. So it's very much an enriched experience today, reading. You have hypertext, you have graphics, you have games, you have access to networks, etc. So it moves from an, an autonomous individual practice to a digital immersive practice. And it's collective. And the reader is not just a reader. He or she is also a commentator, an aggregator, a curator, and even a producer. So there are many additional practices around reading that didn't exist before or that were separated in time and space before, especially in the school environment, like uh, writing, discussing, uh, looking for more, liking, etc. In all this, publishers, especially commercial publishers, are trying to control the reading process. They try to keep children uh, in one space. Apple tries to make them loyal to Apple. Amazon tries to make them loyal to Amazon, etc., etc. But in fact, uh, young people um, turn around uh, commercial spaces and they use them on a more private level. Um, they, um, these levels of users oscillate between leisure and uh, scholastic work, and they bring into the libraries and into reading uh, something that schools usually try to avoid, and which is entertainment. <clears throat> um, digital tools also enable young people to produce their own collections and their own means of storage. No longer the library, no longer the home, but uh, on the tablet. And uh, mobility, of course, is a um, it's increased beyond the library, but remember, paper allowed mobility forever. It's been one of the giant steps uh, with uh, books and papers that you could uh, carry around. So this is just an augmentation. Um, what's new is this hybrid logic uh, where affinity and serendipity uh, are there also with just um, commentaries and um, recommendation by peers and by adults. And don't think of peers as just people with some, the same age. Peers are online are the ones who have the same affinities, and they can be older people. There's a lot of uh, confusion here by us looking at it from the outside, but there's a lot of people, especially older people, who interact with young people online uh, in these spaces for recommendation, especially grandmothers. I can't show it here, but we have the, um, the information. Um, so, if I um, summarize quickly, young people use a variety of devices. So, one of the strategies here is multitasking. They move in different layers of text. They navigate. They circulate te text. They look and they uh, uh, sample them. They transform them by mixing and remixing. They share. They index. They copy on paper. Um, we have what uh, Thierry Bazin calls meta-lecture in French, uh, reading, a meta kind of reading, as a continuous process that is emancipated from paper um, with a lot of interoperable objects. And of course, as a result, interoperability becomes a very important stake uh, for us adults to, to preserve for them. What does this imply for libraries? I think uh, it implies, and libraries have already been doing this. No? The libraries are a very dynamic space, I think, uh, even though they feel shaken in their core missions. Uh, libraries are moving from a logic of uh, equipment and uh, to a logic of users and augmented experiences. They're moving from a logic of system and documents to a more user-centered logic, and they're moving maybe from a logic of uh, stewardship and heritage to a logic of sociability, of uh, juvenile life and uh, inclusion. 
when you look at this library and the way it's been constructed, uh, the, the big forum, to me, uh, is evocative of this possibility of having a common space for, um, for juvenile life, instead of the silent spaces of the libraries of before. <clears throat> so professionals that you are need to focus on these hybrid practices and these, on these hybrid uh, paper and digital collections, and they have to think of um, the new public services for readers that they, uh, they need to offer, considering that the digital is making them gain time in terms of indexation and in terms of um, patrimony. So there's more time at hand normally. What can it be um, occupied with? I would suggest access. Access um, to digital resources and tools in public spaces, public spaces remains key. And libraries need to appropriate these uh, public spaces or else media industries, commercial, advertisement-led, driven um, industries will occupy this cultural space as a monopoly, which is what they almost have at the moment, the GAFAMs. So we need to imagine the technical and temporal modalities of access to online resources, but also a, a means of engaging young people in cultural experiencing. We need to articulate the online and offline activities of young people and turn fully libraries into juvenile spaces. Uh, the representations that young people, but also older people have of libraries is that they are places for books. They're not places for meeting, for talking, for uh, experiencing. And I think this is uh, what uh, has to change in terms of the representation and the image of the library of the 21st century. And so we need to think of libraries as, the French word is tiers lieu, excuse me, as a sort of third space, an alternative space to schools, to homes, the third place of uh, uh, juvenile <coughs> development, where experimentation with the digital world can be done safely safely, and in a way that they master. So one of the possibilities that we're examining in, in INR Translate is to look at these spaces and, and how they're evolving. Um, so, and space is important, and the, the surrounding remains important. The online and offline world are establishing more and more as a continuum, and proximity is, is becoming key thanks to the digital. So um, what we notice when we look at the places that are active and, and have young people come, etc., and inter interact, is that the libraries are becoming or are creating several porous spaces in their own larger space, which they didn't have before necessarily, or which were minor before. So of course, a reading area, a comfortable one, when you read with um, digital devices, read, uh, sitting on the kind of seat you're sitting right now is not ergonomic. It's exhausting. It doesn't allow to interact well with tablets. So we have to invent new ways of sitting and new ways of lying down uh, to read. Um, they can be agoras, enormous spaces where suddenly you meet for some kind of event. They can be workshops, I mean, if you're trying to do some creative reading and creative writing. They can be a game zone to continue exploring your, your book uh, otherwise. They can be kiosks for other kinds of access. And we've talked about employment, CV, etc., etc. Um, in any case, they should enhance uh, mobility uh, between uh, school and the life beyond for, for young people. And they certainly are ways of articulating in situ, in one place, uh, knowledge and know-how. And, and more and more, this should be the case. And libraries are too much attached to know-how, uh, to knowledge, sorry, to something that is um, closed, uh, finished. Uh, knowledge now is also something that you acquire as you do, all this learning by doing approach that is possible via the internet. And so it's the articulation now between knowledge and know-how and, and what I call know-how to become, <laughs> for wardens, the name of my UNESCO chair, is this articulation that we need to, to push. I'm not going to, to go into the details of what I call for wardens, but one of them is, of course, cognitively 
uh, driven, and it's this idea that we all need, and especially young people, no? we all need to um, actualize all the time. And this is done best in libraries, or can be done best in libraries. Oops, and now I've written something in black, which I can't even read myself. But so it's not only a, a physical space, eh, which I told you before, different uh, subsets of spaces in it, eh, but it's also establishing online um, presence, online, online physicality, and trying to read myself. So for instance, among the things that libraries are more and more developing and, and that are the future, I think, for them, it's uh, to have um, online research services that really connect the librarian and all his competence and knowledge and uh, the young people. Uh, it's also the idea that there are apps around and that there should be apps-based access to libraries, to library materials, library programs, uh, so that libraries fully use the functionalities of the internet also, just like any other entity and not just a commercial one. Um, there should also be um, new uh, devices for, uh, new spaces for tryouts of new devices. When something new appears uh, and uh, young people, as you know, uh, have to experience things before they buy them, we are not in a, in a property-based approach on the internet. You have to uh, experience the good, use it, and maybe you'll buy it later. But there's a, a whole culture of trying out hmm, on the internet where libraries could actually be quite vibrant. Uh, there is a um, kiosk idea with 3D printing. Uh, 3D printing is now becoming cheaper and cheaper and it allows people to produce their own books. Why not in the libraries per se? So these are all possibilities. And of course, the most common practice of young people online, recommendation schemes uh, that should be based on what people are um, lending and borrowing in uh, the local library so that there's more and more understanding um, of the local needs. So all these uh, strategies are strategies that are possible for libraries and that we're seeing at different levels uh, in our observations. After access, uh, I would say that uh, where libraries can be implicated in what's happening is, and it's been mentioned by all the speakers this morning, is uh, the new literacies, the, the new skills of the 21st century. Um, and uh, I certainly believe, and I've been activist about it, as you know, that libraries are a place for new literacies because schools are uh, stuck up in their disciplinary silos. And we need a, a third space that allows trans literacies, transdiscipline approach. So uh, we've started uh, at ANR Translit uh, adopting the um, definition of transliteracy by Sue Thomas. Transliteracy is the ability to read, write, interact across a range of platforms, tools and media, from singing and orality to handwriting, print, TV, radio and film, to digital social networks. Yep, that's today's experience for young people when they think they're reading. And in fact, when you try to look at what this is, this whole nebula that is proposed here in, as a transliteracy, uh, in fact, we think, we, we, we make the proposal at Translit that it's about three literacies that are converging together. The information literacy, the one you know as librarians, the ability to uh, search, evaluate, validate information, um, I would say index, classify, if, if I was on a professional perspective, here is the young people's perspective, but also media literacy, which is more of a critical approach to all these uh, dimensions, uh, be able to, to be critical about media, media ownership, uh, content ownership, etc., and also be able to create. Uh, and computer literacy, this big buzz at the moment that all countries, especially in Europe, have about do we introduce the ability to code as a basic literacy. But code, of course, is beyond that. Huh? It's to understand algorithms and mostly, in my opinion, at the level of schools and, and young people, um, the use of protocols of the Internet and its applications. The trans in transliteracy is about transferring these abilities to different informational contexts. Information is key. Uh, and this is in order to build 
uh, our own uh, information cultures. They're not digital. They are information-based. It's information uh, exploitation, it's data mining that is driving this culture where they're going to find both their jobs and their own kinds of participation in democracy. Digital is opaque, in fact. The reality that we have to uh, teach them is about information in books and anything else. The only really threatened form, in my opinion at the moment, is, uh, is the long narrative form. They tend to produce a lot of short narrative forms. The, the book as a long narrative form uh, is the one that is um, probably threatened at the moment, even though they read tons of sagas. So transliteracies, that's what they look like when I try to make something a bit visual. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. They work within schools and, of course, out of schools. Libraries can be in and out. Uh, and they recombine the three cultures around the information. Information about media, information about documentation, what you're doing, information about data. And it's bringing these three together that is going to make um, literate 21st century people, transliterate 20th century people. At the moment, they're doing it, but they're doing it um, in the wild. They, they, they do it intuitively, they don't think about it, and therefore they're guided by the commercial platforms and their specific needs. So as libraries, as adults around the child, our task is to clarify all of this, to make it explicit, and to make them think reflexively on it, so that they can be real masters of their uses and practices. So transliteracy, if I redefine it after Sue Thomas, is about the convergence of comment and content. It's about the convergence of media and information literacy and digital literacy, so-called. And it's about a whole set of new distributed competences that are not taught at school. Operational, to code, to compute, to design, editorial, to evaluate, to publish, and schools does pretty well with writing and reading, pretty well. There's still a lot of um, uh, illiteracy, but uh, school does badly at publishing. And uh, organi organizational skills, um, searching and navigating. These are the new ones besides reading and writing. Navigating, publishing, And, and here I'm speaking from Jenkins' perspective, um, transliteracy is also about mastering a whole set of e-strategies that are computer-based, that are provided by any platform, public or private. And you have them here, play. But play is not about play. Play is about problem solving. And they play games. Simulations. Simulation is not just about simulating. It's about modeling, it's about trying out stuff, making errors, starting again. Content aggregation. Content aggregation is not just copying illegally. It's about self-discovery. It's about using curation tools. It's about classifying. It's something curators like you do, and it's something that uh, the children are using as um, paracuratorial practices. But they're there and they're challenging as adults. Sampling. They mix and remix content all the time, and now, of course, it's not just text-based, it's mostly image-driven. Uh, multitasking. They're constantly interacting di with different tools. Pooling. They're always putting their intelligence together with others and social networking about that. Navigation, which is control over learning. Where is the knowledge stored? How do you create new kinds of knowledge? Networking, which is about collaboration, and it's happening more and more in places that favor collective meetings and ideally libraries. And the coordination peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, which is about talking to others. And it's amazing how much they're using uh, the internet to uh, relate. The internet revolution is a communication revolution as much as an information revolution. 
So, what does it imply for public policy and especially in libraries? Uh, I think we have to revisit the training of librarians. Please don't throw tomatoes at me. Uh, but um, it, um, it may mean a new profile of people applying for this job. Your, the, the way you reach a job or you choose your, your job is a sort of self-selective process and you select it because of the perception you have of a job. If a job changes a lot, the people who are profiling for this job have to change. A lot of you, I'm sure, are telling themselves, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I did not sign for this job as it is now. Yes? It's changed a lot. And maybe it's true, if you'd known it would go this way, you might not have wanted it. So who are the new librarians? How do we make sure their representations of a new library uh, enables them to embrace all the changes and not feel unhappy about being forced uh, to modify their position almost on a weekly basis? So definitely a core curriculum where transliteracy is key, so infomedia, info documentation, info data. It's not that far from what is actually happening, but a lot of librarians are reticent to move into the info data. A lot of, of them are saying, we are not trained in the info media. Their core remains info documentation. Yes, of course. And of course, uh, you could imagine these other uh, skills uh, being secondary, but they can't be uh, blind to them. Um, definitely the possibility that librarians are not just curators of, and stewards of heritage, but also pedagogical mediators, teachers. Again, there's lots of resistance. We are not teachers, and besides, teachers don't recognize us. But they are the ones who probably have the best capacity to create a space for interaction and inclusion, more than the classroom today. They have, have a capacity to transmit transliteracy beyond information literacy, and they can create and help create reading and writing scenarios with other teams. And at the moment, they're crucially not trained into optimizing users, anticipating needs, supporting collaborative experiences. It still remains a very individual task, a one-to-one -one relationship. This may need to change if we move the library into the 21st century and the librarians with it. Training has to be reciprocal. Young people have to be trained the same way. And so they also need transliteracy, so I'm not repeating what I said before, but they need to be able to meet a team of, pe of pedagogues, of teachers from disciplines or whatever, but I would argue with a librarian in their midst. A librarian in the midst, not aside, not beside. And this third space outside the classroom can become an agora for them. And it can connect, it's the only place really where it really connects with the fourth continent, the, the continent that is online, the blue continent of the social networks, or the black continent of the um, jihad, um, or of plot, or whatever. They need to be trained and they need to be evaluated. This is what's missing most for librarians and for young people. There's no evaluation of all these skills and competences. That's why they're in the wild. And they should be, it should be done in a continuum from kindergarten to university. And they should be able to actualize, and that's b true for both constituencies, librarians and young people. There are new ways hmm, for lifelong learning. It's not just scholastic. Hmm? And of course, I'm not going to speak much about MOOCs, but yes, they are one, one of the solutions. And MOOCs could be dispensed in libraries and could be followed collaboratively and collectively and not alone at home, which is one of the problems of MOOCs at the moment. So there's plenty of opportunities. And now the last questions of Vincent, and I'll, I'll be quick so that, uh, because I'm, I'm too long, I, I realize. Um, well, libraries have to continue fighting. It's not, it's not an easy task. Uh, they have to continue lobbying and being activists, and I know you are. 
uh, for access and equity. There's definitely a big fight to deal at the moment against what I call the portal effect of the GAFAMs. I mean, they're really capturing young people and giving them, acculturating them to their needs instead of the young people's needs. So we need an internationally binding instrument for uh, licensing of online content, including the online content produced by young people. Who is the depository of fanfics today? And yet fan fiction, I would argue, is a legitimate kind of literary production. Fight for transliteracy, that's an easy one, so I'm not going to... In inclusion, it was mentioned before by all our politicians, and I agree with them, and there, there has to be a way to uh, acculturate young people to uh, protecting um, issues of access, equity, inclusion, and also asking for the rewards of their own creativity, which again are not being taken care, care of. Some of us talk about labor. And the right to a global information commons. If information is our treasure, we better have a commons. And we better train young people in nurturing and cherishing this commons. At the moment, it's not happening. The extremely blurred boundaries between what is free, not free, uh, accessible, not accessible, proprietor. We have to train them, and it's only by transliteracy that they'll understand the importance of keeping it open and of um, detecting and monitoring uh, fair use or not. So they, um, it's the only way also to make them defend libraries. If libraries appear as uh, the repository of the information commons, Libraries will be treasures, as they've always been.